and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the financial brand. Marketing is the, the center of a massive transformation driven by new technologies, real-time data analytics, and major scientific advances that will power the banking industry. More than ever, we need a new framework for communication, engagement, and loyalty. Financial marketers need to understand this new paradigm and prepare to embrace the opportunities that lie ahead or risk becoming irrelevant or obsolete. We are fortunate to have Raja Raja Manar, Chief Marketing Officer of MasterCard and author of the book, Quantum Marketing, on the show with us today. He will discuss what marketers must do to prepare for a future where everything we once knew about marketing has changed. Anyone who has followed me over the years know that the vast majority of my career was in the area of financial services marketing. The mission of the past, as it is today, is to create messages that resonate with a desired audience so that they will take the desired action. That may be only part of the marketing that has remained the same over time. We are entering the most exciting phase in marketing, a period that our guest today refers to as the fifth paradigm of marketing or quantum marketing. The impact of marketing is being driven by vast amounts of data, applied analytics, AI, 5G connectivity, augmented reality, smart speakers, wearables, and blockchain. These technologies combined with new customer expectations will drive the success of organizations in the future. I really don't know if there's anybody more qualified than our guest today to discuss the risk and opportunities of quantum marketing. So Raja, can you give us a brief background of your career and also what you're focused on today at MasterCard? Uh, Firstly, thank you very much, Jim. And I'll be very happy to share my thoughts uh, during our discussion today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, As to my background, I'm from India. I'm a chemical engineer by training. Following chemical engineering, I went into marketing, MBA. I did from the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore. And I started my career in marketing uh, with a company which was the largest paint manufacturing company in India as their founder flunky of their newly formed marketing department. And having uh, learned things more in a entrepreneurial fashion over three and a half years uh, and doing my own uh, I know, uh, definition of what marketing should be doing. Uh, it, it was a fascinating experience of three and a half years. Then I moved into Unilever, where I had to unlearn a lot of things that I did in my first stint and relearn in a more classical, structured kind of a fashion. Unilever in those days, in India certainly, was a school of marketing where you are taught and when I went into marketing, interestingly, they said, first, you have to go into sales, not into marketing, because unless you connect the dots between sales and marketing, you will never be a great marketing guy. I'm grateful that they pushed me into it. And I had that amazing experience. And I was there with Unilever uh, for about seven and a half years, at which point Citibank hired me uh, into Dubai. So till then, I was in India. Then I moved to Middle East with Citibank launching their credit cards business. And eventually for 15 years, I was there with them. Uh, First in Dubai, then I moved to London. And from London, I came to New York, New York to Chicago, Chicago to New York. Uh, And while at Citibank, I was also the uh, chairman and CEO of Diners Club, which in those days was a fully owned subsidiary of Citibank, but had to be managed as a separate company because some of the franchisees of Diners Club were competitors to Citibank. So there was a a governance uh, uh, aspect out there. So I was actually managing a company fully there. And then subsequently, uh, when the financial crisis happened in 2008, uh, in 2009, I moved into healthcare. And I was there in healthcare with two companies, first with Humana and second with uh, WellPoint, which is now called Anthem. Uh, And from there, I moved to financial services back again, our payment technology, which is MasterCard. Uh, Now this is my ninth year at MasterCard. I just completed eight years. And uh, so here I am. And at MasterCard, I am the chief marketing and communications officer for the enterprise. And I also started a healthcare business with the MasterCard, uh, which today is one of the fastest growing verticals with the MasterCard. And that's the business I'm the president of. So this is what I do for a living uh, on my day job. 
and the <laughs> outside of my day job i'm also on the board of directors of a, a fortune 500 a power generation distribution and utilities company called ppl corporation i'm also on the board of uh, bond secor mercy which is one of the largest healthcare systems both here in the united states as well as ireland it's a not for profit organization uh, so i keep myself busy and of course in between i managed to write my book as well so I mentioned your book in my intro. Can you give us a short overview of the five paradigms of marketing? Absolutely. So marketing is not new as much as we would like to believe. It has been there in the human DNA since antiquity. Evidence of it was found when archaeologists were digging into the ruins of Pompeii and they found evidence of marketing. It was not just evidence of any marketing, but marketing that was well targeted marketing that was well positioned what you would today consider as targeting and location based uh, advertisements were there 2000 years back in pompeii so there were advertisements of pol uh, politicians or political candidates and extolling all their virtues they were put on the walls of the homes of people in high traffic area and amongst wealthy people it started there the entire first paradigm of marketing was based on products. The whole premise was, if you create a great product that, that's better than anybody else's, you price it reasonably, you package it attractively, and you distribute it for easily uh, available everywhere that a consumer wants to buy, consumers will flock to your product, to your brand, and buy it. Why would they not? Because they're getting the best of everything. After all, aren't people logical in their thinking and rational in their decision making. This paradigm persisted for the longest period of time. And then marketers discovered there was something called psychology, something called sociology, anthropology, and they said, you know, wait a minute. People are neither logical in their thinking nor rational in their decision making. It's actually opposite, which is they're irrational and they are emotional not logical. It's more psychological than logical. They are completely driven by feelings and emotions. So we need to build in a lot of emotion into marketing campaigns. This was the beginning of paradigm two, emotional marketing, paradigm versus product marketing. But what we found as marketers have started getting smarter and smarter about these areas of psychology, sociology, and anthropology, and then they said, wait a minute, actually, you don't even need to advertise or show the product. You can sell the damn product even without ever talking about it in a big way to the exclusion of the product. And one of the biggest examples I can give is called MasterCard. Our priceless campaign goes something like this. The father and son have gone to a baseball game. We say the price of the ticket, $15. Price of soda, $5. Price of autographed baseball, $40. But the time spent with your 11-year-old son, priceless. There are certain things in life that, are, that truly matter. They are the ones you should focus your life on, your attention on. For everything else, there is MasterCard. No, we are relegating MasterCard to a subordinate and a subservient role. We don't talk about our credit limits, the safety, the security, the rewards, cashback, uh, points, miles, nothing. We purely talk about the emotion between a father and a son, which has nothing to do with my product if you were to think in one way. So even to the exclusion of the product, you can launch the campaign. Will it be a success? You bet. This is probably one of the most successful uh, campaigns in the history of marketing. 24 years down the line, it is still running really well for us and giving us huge results. This is paradigm two. Then you have got in the mid 1990s, the birth of internet, which changed people's lives. And that was also the time when people, marketers discovered the joy and the power of data. Data analytics till then belonged in the field for the economists, scientists, the nerds and the geeks, not for marketers. But then when they discovered that data can really empower them in unprecedented ways, it changed the field of marketing yet again. So we have now got with internet and data, the third paradigm, which is all about 
uh, digital marketing, internet marketing, uh, precision marketing, decision-driven marketing, data-driven marketing, call it whatever. That's a third phase. The fourth paradigm of marketing happened precisely in 2007, when we moved from the third paradigm to the fourth with the advent of two breakthrough technologies. The first technology was called Facebook. It changed the face of social media completely. It scaled like crazy. People started behaving differently with the social media coming into their lives. And number two was a device called iPhone. With the launch of iPhone in 2007, connected smartphones became an an inseparable part of our lives. Between the iPhone and the Facebook uh, uh, launch, we have have now the fourth paradigm, where you've got social media marketing, influencer marketing, location-based marketing, mobile marketing, call it whatever. That's a fourth paradigm. The interesting thing is from each paradigm to the next paradigm, there were two technologies that were driving. Paradigm one to two was essentially radio and television. Paradigm two to three was internet and uh, data analytics. Uh, from three to four was social media and mobile device, tele- telecom devices. Now we are at the verge of the fifth paradigm. Guess what? Instead of two technologies, we are going to be disrupted by more than two dozen technologies. It's unprecedented. Artificial intelligence, augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, extended reality. Uh, you've got uh, 3D printing. You've got 5G uh, communications. you got drone deliveries. You have got autonomous driving vehicles, smart speakers, Internet of Things, wearables, blockchains. The list goes on and on and on. Each one of them independently is capable of disrupting marketing big time. Just imagine when all these things are coming together, the confluence of these technologies is going to be so disruptive to marketing. That is the fifth paradigm of marketing. Already we are in the uh, sort of, you know, uh, literally, we are at the cusp between the fourth and the fifth and fifth is upon us. Now, the interesting thing is marketing as it worked in the past is not going to work tomorrow or even today. Marketing is failing today big time. With these disruptions coming, every single theory and concept of marketing will be stood on its head. It will be totally toppled. You need to reinvent marketing. You need to reimagine marketing. I'll just give one simple example of physics, uh, Jim, which is in the world of physics, which physics is the science with which you try to understand how the world around you works. There is gravity, laws of gravity, laws of electricity, magnetism, and so on and so forth. But when humanity discovered outer space, classical physics was hopelessly failing. It could not explain how those things are happening in outer space. Or when you go inside of subatomic particles, completely, uh, there was irrelevance or there was a total failure of classical physics in that context. Then a new a branch or a new mode of physics has entered called quantum physics. It, 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 it approached the entire field from a completely different perspective, so much so that it was able to actually explain what was happening. So today, a lot of what science practices is based on quantum physics, which is amazing. In the same way, with all these technologies coming in, the human behavior is changing and all the classical concepts that we have been practicing so far they are just not going to work. They're not able to explain. And you need to reimagine marketing. And that new way of doing marketing is what I call as quantum marketing. So quantum marketing is to marketing how quantum physics is to physics. So this is the broad context and the theme of my book. And uh, we can discuss uh, you know, parts of it as you please. Yeah. And so you and I both know that marketers in, in every industry, not just banking, were schooled in some form of what I'll call traditional marketing, which, you know, one of the dynamics of your five uh, five different paradigms is that the speed of change has increased over time, that the the change in, in timing has escalated. So we know that overall we were mostly schooled in what I'll call traditional marketing. Do marketing professionals today need to start over? Do they need to build from the past? Do they need to hire new talent? or some mixture of that to bridge this massive knowledge gap in what is happening today versus what we are mostly schooled in? First, I think you hit upon it so well. You are spot on. The thing is, many of the professors in marketing, 
if they have transitioned from the industry to the academia, it was several years back when the world was a different place. They are equipped with everything to succeed in the world of the past. Today, they don't have the material to, to teach properly. They don't have, in many cases, the expertise required. And uh, uh, I think they need to reinvent their entire uh, curriculum. They need to reinvent their entire methodology. And to do that, they have to upgrade their own understanding and skills. And I don't mean to say it critically. I love professors and I love the profession of teaching. And I have got the highest regard for my teachers and for anyone who is in the teaching field. I have been working with professors at you know, several colleges like Harvard Business School, uh, Yale School of Management, and so on around the world. And having these conversations very openly. And they say, yeah, you're absolutely right. And so much so, now what I have done multiple things. Number one, I said, we need to make available some of our latest case studies which demonstrate these new principles and the new concepts. So making it available, number one. Number two, I have invited the professors to come and shadow me for a week or two weeks because they need to know what it is to be in the shoes of a CMO. What are the issues that the CMO today faces? And marketers, what do they face today? That's number two. Number three, I said, I'll help you recraft your curriculum. Now, the good thing is there are colleges from Harvard Business School to more than 225 uh, universities around the world, which have actually completely done away with the old curriculum as recently as you know, a few months back. Uh, and uh, in fact, they have clearly acknowledged that they have leveraged my book as they have been re designing their entire curriculum uh, and the methodology of how they teach. So, which I feel very grateful for. The thing is, we have to, we, th these are the people who uh, shape the future generations of marketers and we have to help them. We have to equip these professors with the right material, with the right interactions, with the right, uh, you know, everything that we have got as practicing marketers to be made available to them. So that, that, that thing you're absolutely spot on. There are a lot of professors who are actually investing and spending a lot of time uh, to learn. Uh, and uh, because once they learn, they're able to teach better. And that's exactly what is happening. Well, it's interesting because when I go back to my beginning in marketing, which is 40 years ago, it really, what was difficult was most schools were teaching advertising as opposed to marketing. Most schools had not connected the dots between the, the importance of numbers and analytics and finance to what marketing was. And, and I benefited because I majored in both marketing and finance and it allowed me to, to talk to the finance officer in their language to get funding. But in no place more than financial services, consumers trust our ability to use data, to use yeah. privacy, but also deliver personalized solutions. So how do we balance the need to deliver high levels of contextual experiences while also giving consumers control over their data? So two things uh, I would say. Firstly, I think you're one of those rare examples of people who have done both marketing and finance. And you could have, if you look back at your career, and then you said that would have been a tremendous advantage to you to pitch with credibility investments that you require to your CFO or CEO on the one hand, and also to be able to establish saying that, hey, this is what we got in return for the investments that we have put in. That kind of a quantitative approach actually stands marketers in a very good stead. Today, there are two things. One is the core marketing. The second is the surround systems, finance, technology, data analytics, public relations, uh, human relation, human resources, all these are the surrounding systems or surrounding functions. And so one is how do you connect the dots between marketing at the center and to each one of these areas? So how do you connect the dots between technology and marketing, between human resources and marketing, between public relations and marketing and so on? So this is one part. The other part is the core of marketing. We have been taught about the four P's of marketing which today is totally useless. We talk about purchase funnel in marketing. You got IDAS models and awareness, interest, desire, action, satisfaction. The purchase funnel has collapsed. So there is no purchase funnel. We've been taught about things like loyalty. And I keep giving this provocative example. And if you permit me, I would just like to spend one minute on this yeah. to demonstrate what I'm saying. So when you look at loyalty, for example, 
as an industry, all the companies put together spend close to a trillion dollars every single year just on loyalty programs, on running loyalty programs, a trillion dollars worldwide. That's a humongous amount of money. Interestingly, I came across an article on bbc.com a few, three years back. When they said uh, people, when interviewed, these were couples either married or they were in a living relationship. When they were asked whether they have been loyal to their spouses or their partners, an overwhelming majority, 70%, said they have cheated on their spouses or on their partners. And in all probabilities, that is an understated number because people normally don't admit to these kind of things. Now that set me thinking, which I said, you know, people know that in a relationship they have made either an explicit commitment or there is an implicit commitment in any relationship of loyalty. On the other hand, they also know that if they are not loyal and if they get caught, there are serious consequences. There are reputational consequences. There are financial consequences. There are emotional consequences to the people they care about. In spite of having made the commitment and aware of the uh, consequences, people are anyway not loyal. My question is, now put on your marketer's hand. How smart of you to assume that by just throwing a few bucks at the consumers in some form or fashion, that you're buying their loyalty? If they're not loyal in their personal mm -hmm. lives, for God's sake, why will they be loyal to brands who rank so much lower amongst the scheme of things in people's lives? We are kidding ourselves as marketers and blowing money big time, blowing away money big time in this case. So I said, we need to really rethink. You know, and if I look at myself, every single major airline that flies in the United States, I have got their frequent flyer membership. And when you look at groceries, I got with Costco, I got with Amazon Prime, and I got with uh, uh, Sam's Club, and I got with Kroger's. Then when you look at uh, hotels, literally every single main hotel I have got a, a membership of the frequent, uh, the frequent whatever rewards program, loyalty program as they call it. Are these really loyalty programs? Am I being loyal just because I'm getting these points? No. It's like, you know, I have got a choice. Whatever is most appropriate at that point in time, I may go for that particular choice. So if the marketer on the other side of the company thinks, oh, Raja has used it in response to my loyalty program, he, she's wrong. <laughs> I'm not, right? So the point is we have to realize marketers require stickiness. They need to influence preference. They should not kid themselves that they're earning or winning loyalty. So the entire concept of loyalty has to be changed. And as I said, it's a one trillion industry. And so why are we then teaching loyalty the way we are teaching? We have to change it. So every aspect, look at consumer insights. This is another favorite of mine. So what happens when you're looking at consumer insights? You have got the focus group discussion where people are all sort of you know, putting on pretenses and giving you answers they think that you are looking for. Or even worse, when you look at questionnaires and all the answer some stuff casually online, and then we compile them and look at it as ultimate source of truth. The reality is most of the human decision making happens subconsciously. It doesn't happen consciously. You're asking the rational brain how the subconscious is working. The cognitive brain cannot answer those. They just, there is a post rationalization that happens. And the key thing is, and we are acting on those, which is bizarre. And there are technologies today available to figure out what is resonating with consumers or not through neuromarketing and uh, you know uh, uh, areas like that, and neuro uh, insights and so on. So the way we have to look at uh, uh, finding insights is it should be it's completely being put on its head. So if you look at every single aspect, advertising, I say, advertising as we know is completely dead. Right. So if everything is dead, loyalty is dead, advertising is dead, insights are dead, purchase funnel is dead and so on. And I can take you to every single uh, uh, aspect of the marketing practice, marketing structure and marketing strategies. I'm saying we need to reinvent them. And that's quantum marketing. Well, what's interesting, because, you know, two things that are really resonating. Number one, I think banks over 
oversimplify what they think loyalty is. I have my personal account the same place I've had it for 17 years. I have my business account the same place I've had it for 10 years. But the reality is that both those relationships have been tremendously fragmented by me going elsewhere for different parts of that relationship. I may go to Acorns to have a savings plan, Robinhood for my investment program, PayPal for my payments, um, and, and other elements of that. So I've broken apart this loyalty so that they may have my accounts, but they don't really have my relationship. They certainly don't have my love or my, my exponential desire to work with them. On top of that, to another thing you said, is loyalty today more driven by how much you want to engage, I'll call it on a device, the more often that you go to the device to try to engage, the greater your loyalty becomes because you need that engagement. You know, it's PayPal saying they want to take on uh, Bitcoin on the yep. on the platform. And they point blank said, because we want people to have to go to our platform more than others. Well, again, it gets down to experiences. I wrote an article today for the financial brand that said, has experience trumped marketing as a value proposition? In other words, can you really market me to want to open something that is not easy to open that creates a bad experience? On the other hand, if something's a really good experience, doesn't word of mouth take care of that element of marketing or transfer of value and, and the opening of accounts? And you know, I'm concerned that, especially in financial services, we've made it so difficult or or so commoditized in the way we engage that we really have nothing to talk to with regard to why I want to do business with you, as opposed to many of the fintech firms, many of the payment firms. You know, I, I even question if checking accounts are still the primary financial account as opposed to a payments account. What, you know, you're in the, in the financial services business. What is your perspective on the loyalty in bank, but even more so, what's the, maybe the primary financial account now? So here is the situation. I think banking industry uh, is one of those rock solid traditional industries, right? Uh, and which is very, very, very crucial to our day to day living and uh, very, uh, what you call, dependent on the trust that they can engender. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's your hard earned money that you're keeping there and you want to make sure it is safe, it comes back to you when you want it, and so on and so forth. So trust is critical and it's a absolute necessity for us. But this industry itself is going through a phenomenal transformation. Uh, you have referred to some of the brands like you know, Robin Hood, and you're talking about all the new banks which are out there. If you go outside of the United States, you got banks like a new bank, N-U-B-A-N-K, out of Brazil. They are there in multiple countries. There are, there are banks like N26 in Europe, uh, or Zen also in Europe. So there are a lot of these new banks, or new age banks that are coming out, which are understanding some of the finer needs of the consumers and the gaps that the current banking industry has that they are not addressing. So if there is a need or if there is a gap in the experience of the consumers that you as a bank are not filling in, somebody else will come and, fill, come and do it. And that's exactly what is happening, right? The way these small uh, and the new startups are actually winning ground is really touching upon those in a very effective kind of a fashion on the one hand. And on the other hand, what they're also doing is making it much more uh, consumer centric. See, if you look at the entire evolution of banking way back, way back as in even 40 years back, when you are going to a bank and you're borrowing, you are treated a little like, you know, we are doing you a favor kind of an approach. And I remember when I joined Citibank, uh, there was a speech from John Reed at that time, he was the CEO of Citibank. He has mentioned, saying that look, actually, if you look at the way bank makes money, we make more money by lending than by right. keeping money with us. Because what will you do if you collect deposits and keep it with us? You have to lend to somebody else to make money. And guess what? The arbitrage, which is basically the lending interest minus the borrowing interest from the consumers. If you look at that difference, the entire profitability is driven by your lending predominantly. So why is it that we treat consumers who are coming to borrow money from us as lesser citizens compared to somebody who is coming with a million dollars in their suitcase right. to us? It is absolutely brilliant insight, right? Now, in the same way, from there, the evolution has started. I think probably, in, to my mind, 
uh, in the mid uh, 80s to 90s is when Citibank has actually really transformed, at least in the international markets, how banking is done very consumer oriented and between Barclays and City, they have launched the ATM machine that is a deployment of technology, branchless banking, telephone banking, internet banking. It's been going, definitely it's been evolving. It's not that the industry has been static. But then still in banks, the mindset is relatively still traditional and conservative. The new players have no such, uh, you know, what you call constraints or baggage. They just go and say, this is the need for the consumer. Let me make it happen. Let me make banking more fun. Let me make, uh, you know, banking more exciting. Let me empower the consumers as to what they will do with the data. Like in the context of Europe, for example, there is something called open banking, which has been launched, right. right? Where you're saying, consumer, you are in charge of your data. You are the owner of your data. You want to make it available to 10 different parties. God bless you. Go and do it. No issues at all. Now, that kind of a thing would have been unthinkable 20 years back, 30 years back. But now that's become the norm, which is what is giving rise to all these new banks that are coming in, new financial services providers who are coming in. I remember initially there was a company at a time called Yodli.com. Oh, yeah. And then there was Mint, which actually uh, you know was leveraging the technology. And now we have got Finicity. Now, these are the organizations which actually have started putting more of consumer centricity into the whole thing. This journey is going to keep going. When consumers see how it feels to be in control, when consumers discover the joy of fun, they will stick more to that. Again, don't confuse that for loyalty. That is still, okay, this is fun, so I'll have, go and have fun. But I'm not obligated to come back there to have the same fun again. I might actually look for some other bank which is giving me a different kind of a thing. You hit upon the point of experience and whether experience has trumped marketing. The way I would look at it is marketing has evolved and should be evolving to make consumer experience at the center of it. So it is experiential marketing as opposed to marketing versus experiences. And I think that confluence is extremely critical. And in fact, I'll give you the example at MasterCard, what we do. We said that it is consumer experience that matters, but we are not a direct-to-consumer company. All we do is we provide a technology platform. A bank issues products on our technology platform to their consumers, and those consumers, they do whatever it is, and their experience is completely controlled by the bank, which is issuing them the card, the financial institution, which is giving them that experience. So we said, that how can we get into the experiential side? Because we are not B2C or a D2C, direct to consumer. So what we have done is we started curating experiences for people, for everyone that money cannot buy. We call this priceless experiences. I shifted a significant portion of my marketing budget away from traditional marketing and started putting into experiential marketing. So we identified in people's lives there are 10 areas that we have chosen to focus on. Music, sports, uh, philanthropy, culinary activities, uh, travel, shopping, uh, environment and sustainability, movies, arts and culture, and health and well-being. So in these 10 areas, we will curate experiences for our consumers as MasterCard and make them available to, uh, to them. They can go and avail of these experiences. One In each one of them, we strive to make it mind-blowing. Really will leave you with a strong memory and that will impress you about our brand in a very positive way. This was a hypothesis. When I first suggested this in MasterCard, there were a lot of people who were nervous, I must say. But fast forward today, our brand is on a tear because of the strategy that we have adopted. And you know, from 87 on Brand Z, we were ranked number 87 on Brand Z. So today we are at number 10. And we are at number eight in the United States. So two steps ahead of the rest of the world. That's how fast we have actually been moving and how far we are coming in. So experiences critical, but experiences blended into marketing, which is an experiential marketing. That's what I would say. So, so let's take a short break here and recognize the sponsors of this podcast. This show is sponsored by FIS. The way we move money is changing. We want to send money in real time to the other side of the world. We want everything in one place, integrated, seamless, and on our devices, embedded, fast, standardized, frictionless, and secure. These are our financial futures. 
capital markets have always evolved quickly. But when the world had to overcome the challenges thrown at us by the pandemic, that evolution accelerated exponentially. Almost overnight, an entire industry realized that the key to resilience depend on the ability to provide premium customer experiences through digitalization powered by centralized, seamlessly accessible data. Is the world's technology up to the challenge? Are we? Find Financial Futures on your favorite podcast app presented by FIS. FIS, advancing the way the world pays, banks, and invests. Welcome back. I'm joined today by Raja Rajamanar, Chief Marketing Officer of MasterCard. We've been discussing how banks and credit unions must rethink everything they once knew about marketing and what the future of customer engagement may look like. So Raja, we've been discussing a little about the back office components of marketing from a data analytics perspective. Let's move on to how messages are delivered. What do you see as the biggest changes that will be seen in the ways consumer markets are actually absorbing consumer marketing in the future? So firstly, data is the fuel for marketing. Data, all kinds of data, consumer data, behavioral data, demographic data, economic data, call it all kinds of data, even weather data, they're all pretty critical both to analyze what happened in the past, as well as to be able to identify the opportunities or to identify the way messages have to be delivered or the type of messages themselves that have to be delivered. So data is going to be at the front end center. Now it's already there. It's not as if it is going to happen where we wake up tomorrow and it's going to happen tomorrow. It's already there. But the way it is there today and the way it is going to be there tomorrow is going to be completely different. How so? First, the extent of proliferation of data is going to be crazily high, exponentially high. Today, uh, data is, uh, I have got my phone, and my phone, I have got it, and then it's capturing continuously data and putting somewhere in some cloud for various people to access it. I may be aware of some of them, I may not be aware of many of them. Now, if you look at your home, more and more devices in your home are getting connected to the internet. Your refrigerator, your washing machine, your dishwasher, your coffee machine, your weighing scale, uh, your uh, you know, wearables like this is, uh, you know, the help. Yep, the watch. Yep. Exactly. Right? Watches. Uh, now you have seen the announcement of uh, Facebook. You have got the uh, glasses. It's going to be a zillion uh, uh, sensor equipped uh, devices all around you. What used to be a simple harmless dishwasher today will tomorrow be a connected dishwasher that makes your life even easier, even more easier. Your toothbrush already is now getting connected, right? You've got the connected toothbrush launched by uh, Procter & Gamble as an example, or it'll be. Now, the point is each one of these devices will start gathering data and they'll be transmitting data. So there's a deluge of data, literally. So when you have more data, two things happen. How do you make sense out of that data and come to actions in real time? That is now possible because of the confluence of higher and higher capabilities of computing on the one hand, higher and higher capabilities of 5G, which transmits data at breakneck speed. And then you have got artificial intelligence, which crunches data like no human being or no existing computer can. Between all these things, when they come together, the impact is amazing, extraordinary. And it will give you such powerful insights and it will give you such timely advice to act for actions to be taken. And you don't even have to take action by yourself. The machines take action on your behalf as a marketer. So with the result of which, marketing is going to go into a more real-time more than ever before. In the past, we had barely real-time marketing uh, campaigns. Now you have real-time marketing campaigns. Just to give you an idea, at MasterCard, when we were trying to look at how we can go towards these real-time marketing activities, we, we created something called the Priceless Digital Marketing Engine in Singapore. We created it there. And when we launched it, what we are finding now, and it's live and kicking, right now, it has got efficiencies or efficacies 
anywhere between four to eight times of your traditional digital campaign. We're not talking percentages here. We're talking of multiple. And we are just getting started. This is on one hand. On the opposite side of the spectrum is consumers are freaking out that their privacy is getting compromised, that they're being snooped into, that their data is being lost, it's being stolen, and all they get in return is a, 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 an apology letter from the whichever company has uh, messed up with their data. And so we have been hacked, so sorry about it. And we'll give you one year of free credit monitoring, which is so lame. And as a consumer, I feel infuriated. I had just one two weeks back from a hospital system. Yeah. Okay. Saying that sorry, mm-hmm. this has happened, but don't worry, we'll watch it and then we'll give. That is not just acceptable. So consumers are getting more and more uh, upset about it. Now there are device manufacturers and platforms like you look at Apple. Apple has said that we are about privacy. Tim Cook has made comments that privacy is a fundamental human right. And I completely agree with him. I totally agree with him. Now, the thing is, so they are saying, we are going to have do away with all the cookies. We are doing, going to not let you, uh, you know, track. And actually, when I use, for example, my iPhone, I get notifications. This app is, is tracking you. Do you want, allow, want to them, allow them to ask? Of course not. Why the hell should they track me? I said, no. Okay, there are opt-outs that happen. And I, as a marketer, I'm doing it. Uh, okay, as, as a, in, a, right. in, a, in my consumer role. So when I put on my marketing hat, I said, my God, this is going to be very, very difficult for us. How to target, how to retarget, how to make sure that there is relevance of what you're communicating. But it's not marketer's convenience that you have to look at. It's a consumer's privacy that you should respect. That's the most important thing. Now, Google has temporarily postponed for two years. They're taking away the cookies. Now, the privacy laws are coming up around the world. You have got GDPR already in EU. You got California Consumer Protection Act. Now, 50 states are apparently looking at their own versions. EU is looking at the next version, e-privacy law and stuff like that. The point is, regulatory pressures are going to go up. Consumer privacy concerns are going to go up. In the meanwhile, the hackers will become even more sophisticated of breaking into various systems. So the data that you are sitting on of consumers is going to be more at risk. And so that is the other side of the spectrum. So you got on one on one hand, you have got like, you know, you feel like Alice in Wonderland with so many you know data and artificial intelligence and devices and ability to reach consumer in real time based on insights. On the other hand, you've got these real consumer concerns. Marrying these two is going to be very tricky. Well, it's actually going to be a value transfer proposition, isn't it? I mean, we we pay for the opportunity to shop on Amazon and they manage our data on a regular basis. And I think I was asked, do I do I mind Amazon utilizing my data? I said, I don't mind that one. But I don't think I've said yes to any other. Well, part of this is because the value that Amazon gives and the lack of being hacked that they've also had makes it so that I'm a little less concerned about that. So there's a value proposition here as to what am I going to get in return for giving up my privacy? And I want to still control that, as you mentioned. But is there a time in the future when maybe brands may be trying to impact the decision process of my personal AI as opposed to me as a human? Beautiful point, actually. That's a brilliant point. So two questions, two points I want to address. The second one, uh, uh, you know, but first let me come to the other one, which is on, you know, you are willing to share your data if you are convinced that your data is safe. Yep. You are convinced that they respect your privacy and not abuse and misuse it. And you also have confidence in that company to safeguard your data. Right? And that's spot on. Plus, and not just the, uh, the avoidance of negative experiences, but what, what, I like the fact that when I get to Amazon, I'm not going to have to look through 25 different choices. They pretty much have it nailed in the first four on what I've bought in the past. Right. So that's a value that you're deriving, the convenience, right? Yep. So it is an equation. It's a value exchange equation in the context of, in the context of trust. That, that's the key thing. And the trust enabled by transparency of what they're going to do with your data, a, an assurance that your data is protected, and a reassurance that they will not abuse and misuse your data. Yep. 
if that is all working then you will say yeah okay fine why not no problem at all but the context is constantly changing suppose somebody gives you all that value and they give you everything else and they say look you know what we still think that your data should be with you we don't want you to have your data your preference might change because preferences are also relative the value right. is also relative right so yeah. it's going to be pretty fascinating and also i'll tell you another thing if if i were to tell you that whether it is amazon or any other uh, e-commerce company that they are actually selling your data to advertisers and making billions of dollars does it change your perception oh yeah and right that's right yeah and take another situation and these are real examples you know they are right. the various platforms e-commerce platforms they do sell uh, uh, your data not your data that's it. but they sell that information from your data to various advertisers to right. for them to serve how do you get a sponsored mm-hmm. ad in front of you that sponsored ad right. person has paid because somebody has told them that you are the right target audience for them so therefore they try to get in front of you so it, there is commerce it's not all just about goodwill and uh, uh you know a good heartedness there is absolutely commercial interest for everyone in this ecosystem and there is nothing wrong with it so long as it is fair now there are companies for example which have come up saying that you know what if i am monetizing your data on the one hand i have to give you value and protect everything else and gen- earn your trust but also maybe i should actually share part of my income with you because i am making money off of your right right there are companies like you know for example i saw this uh, uh, browser called brave which has actually done just that and there are, and they got some 20 25 million ca- subscribers already our customers there are platforms like that emerging in other countries uh, in singapore and the point is there is it is a moving target what you think is of value to you today when you know a bigger picture you might say hey i didn't know that or you say oh i can also get this i didn't know that no no i know that i better get it so you better give it to me so it's 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 fascinating so that's one part of it the second one how do you defend yourself and do you need to have your own ai to keep you safe to to help you navigate this crazy world powered by other people's bots right right i think this is a fascinating one uh in the healthcare i'll give you a healthcare example because it's much simpler to uh you know understand and then get back to marketing oh, it's great because my next question was about the combination of healthcare and finance so you're you're on the right track that's great fantastic so in healthcare if you look at it in the united states you have got something called medicare try to navigate medicare and make sense out of it and decide what is right for you impossible so there are people who are appointed called medicare navigators you hire their services to be able to understand what is out there the system is so archaic and so crazy that you need people to interpret what they are offering you and help you make the right choices on the one hand then you got other kinds of companies the so these on healthcare now I'll, I'll shift the thing to your identity on the digital space you got companies like lifelock who are actually monitoring on your behalf for you for a fees of course and figuring out oh maybe his co- data is compromised and it has surfaced in some dark web or there has been a breach or no and they alert you and you are actually hiring somebody else's ai in that particular space to protect yourself because they are deploying ai to do it so you may not have your own individual customized ai today but who knows what will happen in future yeah. i'm sure there'll be personalized ai engines that you can get it might not be like i have got somebody sitting next to me and do, doing it but what is today happening with lifelock as an example or any of your identity monitoring solutions they get together across multiple spheres of your life and tell you what your rights are how you can protect yourself and how you can monetize your data this is all getting there consumer is going to be the king or the queen oh yeah that's the, that's the way it has to be uh so uh, th- just i wanted to respond to that but that's a fascinating thought that you have and i think uh, it, that's going to happen okay so next to the last question is you you're responsible for both financial services and now the uh medication or the um the healthcare <laughs> services yeah. yeah do you see a time in the very near future that these two major industries will come together and will be able to monetize better insurability be able to monetize better health 
be able to monitor things that will give financial rewards. You see a, maybe a, a combination of these two major industries to build incentives or gamification for better health. Absolutely, yes. And that's exactly the mission from MasterCard's perspective as to why we entered into healthcare. Financial services, you have learned a lot. Uh, and they're ahead of the curve compared to uh, health industry, healthcare industry, like a yep. fraud, fraud detection and prevention. <clears throat> Financial services are far superior in how they manage that compared to health industry. Consumer management and all these engagement platforms you have, which are misnomered as loyalty programs, they rarely, they hardly exist in the healthcare industry. The, you know, in a, in a healthcare, uh, uh, you know, for example, if you look at it, hospitals, when they have a patient who comes in and has got a procedure, and at the time of checkout, you give a bill to the patient. Believe it or not, 40% of the total billings never get recovered. In credit card industry, that number is less than 6%. If you are 6%, you'll fall off the chair and you'll freak out. Yeah. Here, 40%. So what we did is, in fact, because I spent time in the healthcare industry before coming to uh, payments, I saw a lot of similarities and I saw a lot of opportunities for the cutover between the two. Take the competencies and the capabilities that we have in the financial services space, in the payment space, port them into the healthcare space. Now, one example that you gave, and I'll just elaborate on that a little bit. So if you know that somebody has got uh, health-related issues, so healthcare data is one big silo which itself is fragmented into a million other silos. This hospital doesn't talk to this doctor, doesn't talk to this hospital, doesn't talk to this pharmacy. It's all a disjointed system. It's, I think it's even wrong to call it a healthcare system. It's not a system. Uh, and you try to analyze and then try to say what's going on here and then what should be the best course of action. But you know that healthcare is significantly impacted by your lifestyle. And guess what? But how you spend on your credit card or debit card or whatever it is, you can actually get a good idea of the lifestyle of the individual. Just imagine the power when you combine with complete responsibility for consumers in every which way. For the, It's a consumer-first kind of a proposition. When you bring the lifestyle data from credit cards and the healthcare data from the health industry, the kind of insights that you can get is absolutely astounding. And well, that's actually what Ping Yan has done in China. I mean, they bring together the financial services and the insurance business on not just health insurance, but also property insurance and car insurance. And they can, you know, between the combination of their financial information, and their other data, they basically have the, the treasure trove of, of insight that allows totally. both areas to be more efficient. Absolutely. There is a synergy. There is a positive impact on both sides of the equation. Uh, and, and same as likewise, you know, if you look at fraud, uh, uh, fraud, wastage, and abuse. Uh, you know, what happens is, unfortunately, there are, there are intended and intentional or unintended and intended errors that creep into claims that are submitted by the hospitals and the doctors to the insurance companies. And the insurance companies keep denying, etc., etc. So you don't know if a doctor has, for example, just examined your chest with a stethoscope and has written a claim for having done your ECG when it was not done. It, they are prevalent, they're widely prevalent, this kind of what, there is a technical term in healthcare called upcoding. You are saying that you have done this, but in reality you have done something much lesser. And there is a lot of, so we have, for example, in the health, in the payments industry found patterns through which we can detect fraud. Very interestingly, we can do that and all, and in re, literally like real time. We said, how will it look like in the context of healthcare if we were to take those same capabilities and deploy? The answer is fascinating possibilities. Oh, yeah. Well, we saw, we saw that uh, there's firms in China right now that just the way you use it, your phone, just the type of usage you have, I, they can detect who is going to probably be a bigger risk, you know, credit risk than those that don't. And, and they get it down to a real fine science. But again, the, the, obviously, the privacy laws are a whole lot different in China than they are here. And it's a matter of what's the value proposition at the end of the day. So, Raja, exactly. Raja has a last question. You know, we, we talked about financial institutions. We talked about digital transformation, marketing modernization, the future of marketing and communication. Right now, if you were to put money on a, on a, 
on a category of the industry in the financial services, who, who becomes the big the winners? Are they the big banks, the fintech firms, the major tech organizations, the platform players, or somebody else? I would say it will be the fintech powered platform players. There you go. You 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 hedged your bet by taking combinations thereof. That's good. Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> so give me an example. PayPal, a PayPal of the world, and see, I, I think PayPal is doing very well. Yeah. If you look at that uh, trajectory, and they're also getting into Bitcoin right. and cryptocurrencies and all that, so it's pretty fascinating. And I would say that it could be, for example, Mastercard. I am. I would feel very very optimistic about our yeah. future, as also. The other folks in this net in this space, whether it is a Visa or Amex or whoever it yeah. is, I think because you know if you look at for example for most of these companies, we are still digitizing the economy. Yeah, we are still digitizing the payments at this point. We are not even getting into some very sophisticated stuff. We are still making at the end of the baby steps, so to speak, because today if you look at the entire payments industry, only fifteen percent is digitized. Eighty-five percent is non-digital. Yeah. There itself is a huge headroom for all the companies and the networks. That's on one side. Uh, the fintech companies, that's a very interesting thing where they are focusing on one specific area, two specific areas, and hitting the ball out of the park. Yep. So when you're so focused or even obsessed on the consumers in such a powerful way, it can make a huge difference. So it could well, you, be look, you look at companies like Lending Club that bought a traditional bank for the deposit side of the business. And as you said earlier in the conversation, you know, the lending is where the revenue is. And and actually, in many cases, my loyalty is stronger to somebody that lends me money than somebody lets me put money in their financial institution. So, you know, it, it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch. It is interesting also because I've said this on other broadcasts that, you know, PayPal kind of got caught. You know, they, they're a fintech firm in the in the more traditional sense. They're almost like a legacy fintech firm because they got caught somewhat un, unprepared when buy now, pay later took over the industry in a matter of months. I mean, it, and and by the way, that again is not a new concept, layaway and and you know the right. old the old layaway program. But but this is the digital version of layaway, which is a great case study in and of itself. But you know, Raja, thank you so much for being on the show. You know, as I said, um, I'll tell people right now. If you don't have the book already, please get Quantum Marketing. It is not a huge book. It's easy to absorb. Get it on tape. Get it in a hardback. Get it in a paperback. The reality is it is a textbook for modern marketing. And I'd actually say a wake-up call to anybody in the marketing business, product business, social media business. Pro you know, Overall, it really is a, a wake-up call to say, beware, things are changing. And, and here's where they're going to go. Raja, again, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so very much, Jim. Absolutely pleasure chatting with you. And hopefully your audience will find it of some value. Thank you so very much. We hope to hook up again in the near future. Thank you. Look forward to Thank you. Thank you for listening to Banking Transform. Rate is a top five banking podcast. I genuinely appreciate the support you've provided since we started this endeavor. If you enjoy what we're doing, please be sure to follow Banking Transformed on your favorite podcast app. In addition, please take some time to show some love in the form of a review. It really means the world to us and really can change the dynamics of the guests we get. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and check out the amazing research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Rule Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, the arrogance of success is to think that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. <laughs>